Greetings and welcome everybody. Hi there. I am Dr. Wolf. I'm Tarek Dragon. And I happen to be on vacation. <laughs> we just watched A Health of Information. Yeah, we watched it together. Now I think, I have, well, I have a problem. What's the, the problem? The title of the episode, just, it, it doesn't seem to really fit. In what way? Well, I, I get it. It's a pun. They're t it's a pun on wealth of information. And I can kind of, I have to sit there and think about it. Okay, because they gained their health back because they were able to obtain information. I kind of get that, but I think you know, the title doesn't really work with, it doesn't work for me. Okay. It's still clever. Yeah, sort of. Anyway, talking about health of information, um... Bring back one of my favorite characters, Zakora. Yes. And unfortunately, Zakora gets sick, and that starts the whole plot of the episode. And so Fluttershy yeah. has to go through quite a bit of gyrations to figure out what's wrong and solve the problem. Because she feels personally responsible. The whole reason this got started in the first place is because Zakora was helping her gather some moss from the swamp. And the whole lesson of the episode is that because Fluttershy was so hyper-focused tunnel vision on trying to find a cure no matter what, that she neglected to take care of herself. And because she forgot to take care of herself or she neglected to take care of herself, it caused, it caused more problems than it would have otherwise. And uh, you know, Twilight from the very beginning was, was telling her she needed to get rest and would it have been different had she gotten rest? Oh, most likely. Honestly, I think the episode was enjoyable for a first viewing, but it ended up being a lot darker the more you think about it. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, these flowers turn ponies into trees and most of Equestria never found a cure. See, that was my prediction from the very beginning, at the first commercial break, after the doctor told her that the disease turns ponies into trees, my, uh, my, oh no, it was actually after they figured out about uh, the, um, um, the mystical mask. Yeah. And uh, my, during the commercial break, I was talking to Dr. Wolf and I was saying, okay, here's my prediction is that the, this mystical mask, she disappeared because she was turned into a tree. And he responded that... Uh, hang on a second. We have already got set up from previous episodes that this is one of the Legends of Magic characters that have been shown in the comics. And so... They're obviously not going to have a character that uh, disappeared and is never going to show up again. It's just one of the ancient heroes of old. But bringing that up, you have to wonder if there are a whole lot of other ponies out there who were never cured and are still trees. Because the very first scene, those opening first few seconds, you see a tree and a breeze comes along and a, few and a few flowers fall off of it. I mean, what are they implying right there? I mean, the more you think about this, the ever-free forest in and of itself, the reason why it's such a darkly magical place to begin with... It's full of pony trees. If that's what they were going for, explaining the Everfree Forest because it's made up of <laughs> ponies that have been turned into trees? That's really super dark. Oh my goodness. Oh wow. Yeah. That's, this is no longer a little girl's film, guys. It's now Revenge of the Body Snatchers. Uh, they weren't explicitly stating that that's the case, but you have to wonder if Someone had the idea behind the writing team that maybe that we just take the idea and run with it because it, it, it starts to make sense for a lot of things, maybe. Oh, and it, they're, they're really, they're only implying it. Nobody comes out and says it directly. And yeah. so I'm sure some fans, there's going to be headcanon and some fans are going to come go out there and say this whole 
field of trees was once a, a, a village of ponies, and then they get this really dark storyline. Yeah. It'll go off in that direction. I'm sure Hasbro will never go there, though. Yeah, they'll never go there, say, state it directly. It's just, it's a very interesting idea, even if it is a very dark idea. Uh, they only play it up for fun in the episode itself, because they never show a pony or a zebra having anything more than just a few leaves and a couple of branches sprout out and coughing up bubbles and sneezing lightning bolts. Which is, you know, that 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 was disappointing to me because I saw Zakora sneeze a lightning bolt and I thought, oh, that's cool, this is one of her powers and she just lost control. But no, Fluttershy sneezed a lightning bolt too. It was just a symptom of the disease. Yeah, the only thing Zakora lost control of for even just a moment was her rhyming. Yeah. First time in the series that she had lost the ability to rhyme, it was because she was sick. That was really too bad. I was thinking, oh, I want to see all of Zakora's powers. I mean, there are definitely things about Zakora that we don't know yet, and yeah. here I thought we were seeing more of it, but sadly I was disappointed. Yeah. All right. Going back to the story, I like the idea that they were setting up that when you are so hyper-focused tunnel vision on trying to fix a problem, especially one that you feel personally responsible for, that when you neglect taking care of yourself, you really hamper your ability to help others. There's a lot that both Tarek and I can say on that subject, and there's a lot of truth to that idea. There is, it's, it's interesting that the, third, the first thought that occurs to me is, uh, you know, I, I work in the gaming industry, as a lot of you know, and there have been times where I have had uh, 80 plus hour work weeks, you know, where we're working very late hours, you know, and I don't leave the office until 11 or 12 at night. And, uh, and then I'm, I come home and I'm super tired and I sleep for five hours and then I get up and go to, go to work again. Um, that, I, I've realized over time how unproductive that is. That actually, uh, it causes more mistakes because you're tired, you're not focused, you're not able to, to think clearly and uh, because you have a lack of sleep you have a lack of you know you're usually eating junk a lot of the time during that time and so you're just you're you're not taking care of your health and so your productivity it goes down they actually point this out in the episode itself because uh, when Fluttershy and Twilight arrive at this middle of nowhere in the swamp village and they see this little house in a tree Fluttershy goes up to the door, she spends two seconds trying to budge it open, and in her exhausted state, her first thought is to, I'm going to dig my way in. That's what the writers are trying to establish, that when you are so hyper-focused tunnel vision on trying to solve a problem that you're just neglecting taking care of yourself, you don't think clearly. Well, and see, that really seems like more like something that, that Pinkie Pie would do. Yeah, that does seem like a Pinkie Pieism, doesn't it? You know, I've, I've never seen Fluttershy do something. In fact, I've never seen Fluttershy do a lot of the things that she did in this particular episode. She was really pushy. She was feeling personally responsible. And in some ways, she was the only one who felt that the circumstances were really as dire as they are because Zikora was slowly turning into a tree and no one knew a cure. And no one else seemed to think that this was as big a deal as Fluttershy did. I can kind of see why she felt this sense of urgency because, well, of course, nobody really knew how long it would take yeah. to complete this transformation into a tree. And nobody knew if it was really reversible or at what point it becomes the point of no return. Yeah. The doctor really didn't go into those details, and so we don't we didn't know. And so I can see how why Fluttershy felt this sense of urgency. And but it, on the other hand, it seems like Twilight was pretty laid back about the whole thing. Mm, she was willing to go along with things, but she had to play the voice of reason to counteract Fluttershy's tunnel vision. There had to be one character to step back and say, hey, Fluttershy, you need to take care of yourself. Someone had to fill that role. So even though I had to question why Twilight was suddenly feeling so 
relaxed about the situation, even though that Sakura was sick with a disease that had no known cure and slowly turning into a tree, you'd think that there'd be a little more urgency to Twilight, but someone had to actually say those things in order to make Fluttershy's eventual lesson make sense. Yes, I can understand that. Now, see, this is also an interesting contrast. Yeah. Most of the time when you put Twilight in a situation that where there is a sense of urgency, yeah. <laughs> we get stressed out Twilight. And, you know, hijinks ensue and it's always a lot of fun and we see Twilight doing really off-the-wall things. Yeah. This time, she didn't go there. She was, she actually sat back and she was the calming influence to where Fluttershy was freaking out. With the exception of when she was cooking. And when she was waking up from after when she was cooking. <laughs> She's in her. She's in her room. She's sleeping. She's like nine by thirteen. Nine by man. thirteen, and then, and then nonstick coating. <laughs> that was funny. I love the expression there too. And, and the, and this happened twice in about five minutes, yeah. where Fluttershy just kind of interrupted Twilight, and then Twilight immediately just jumped and fell over. Yeah. And I, you know, it was really fun to watch both of those times. I think the MLP staff inserted those little. Uh, Twilight-isms, for lack of a better word, in order to contrast her normally, or her uh, trying to be the voice of reason moments. Because if she just had nothing but those voice of reason moments, you have to imagine there'd be plenty of fans out there who said, you know, I missed Lesson Zero Twilight <laughs> in these episodes. Because looking at the way Fluttershy was acting, a lot of it seemed reminiscent of Lesson Zero Twilight, wasn't it? Where she was so hyper-focused, tunnel vision, exhausted, and not seeing the broader picture, not taking care of herself. So they had to put in the uh, 9x13 nonstick coating <laughs> in order to uh, show that the writers hadn't forgotten that Twilight has those moments too, and I can appreciate that. Yes. All right, moving on to some of the other major characters in this particular episode. We have the Mystical Mask. Yeah. Also known as Mage Meadowbrook. Yes. One of the six ancient heroes, apparently, that we have already seen in the comics. I don't read the comics. Neither do I. It gives me headaches when I try to read comics these days. Why is that? I, I wish it didn't. I try to read these days. I try to read. It takes as little as 30 seconds for my eyes and my head to start hurting. I'm serious. Maybe you need your eyes checked. These help, but I've been to a doctor and an ophthalmologist multiple times, and I'm taking medication, and these have made a difference, but they are not a cure. All right, now cue all of the the comments on YouTube about uh, advice on how to take care of your Yeah, vision. I've, I've seen a lot of those, believe yeah. me. I am seeing professionals. I am getting help, but I am not there yet. We don't know how to fix this yet. Okay. Anyway, back to uh, Mage Meadowbrook. Uh, apparently lived a long time ago, back in the time when they would still use plague masks uh, to treat diseases, which I thought was a really interesting yeah, touch. Yeah, I like that. I really did. Um, and then, so she was a uh, uh, she was the daughter of a village healer, and uh, her mother was teaching her. Uh, and she had come up with a lot of different potions and concoctions to help cure diseases. And uh, she overcame all of this. Now, um, uh, one of the things that I thought was very interesting was you see the entire village contracting this swamp fever. Yeah. Except for her. Why wasn't she? Why? They see that that that's interesting. At first, I thought, okay, maybe it's because she got stung by the flash bees, and maybe that was carrying some of their immunity with them. Yeah. But we saw that happen to Fluttershy too, and that didn't cure her. So I don't know. It's just something to ponder and think about. It could be that she is one of the ancient heroes of old, and she has to be the hero of the story. And it, how can she be the hero if she's too sick in order to get the cure? Because. Yeah. Fluttershy was in the middle of failing because she was too sick to take care of herself. Mind over matter. Yeah. No. <laughs> anyway, we were discussing also, we saw some, especially with, with, um, with Mage uh, Meadowbrook and uh, with Cattails, her descendant of I don't know how many generations, um, we were talking about their accents. Yeah. It seems more uh, rustic 
southern, yeah, rustic southern. That what you said. Yeah, I mean, if you look, at, you know, you you watch something like uh, the movie Gone with the Wind, right? Yeah, and you have there are, there are different southern types of accent where you have the very highbrow, very high class southern accent, like the southern bell type of accent, and this was more it it, it didn't fit so much with that type of accent as more the common folk rustic type of accent that you would see. Yeah. And so when when I was when I was hearing that, I would picture some woman wearing a, you know, a bandana uh, uh, cooking over a stove and then, you know, shaking yeah. a wooden spoon at somebody. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> it's not quite Cajun levels. When I first was listening to Cat Tail, it almost sounded Cajun, but it's not quite that thick. No, it's not quite Princess and the Frog mosquito character yeah. thick. No, it wasn't quite that thick, but definite, definitely Southern. Um, uh, but listening to Cattail, uh, the first thought that I had was, well, this here's Virginia. And uh, I don't know, you know, I probably really butchered that accent, but that Kinda. was the first thought that I had. Yeah. Is the story, how does it compare to the other Legends of Magic characters that we've seen in the season thus far? I don't know how many that you've seen. I haven't seen them. You probably no. haven't seen any of them, so... If I had to choose among the five characters we've seen thus far, I don't know. Life's full of tough choices in it. it. Yes, we, we tend to do Disney quoting all the time. Oh, and that's usually what comes off the top of my head. Yeah. Which is quite often. I think the most interesting character that I've seen thus far was probably uh, the legend that Rarity told. If you, several episodes back. She seems to be the most interesting, but looking at the cover of Legends of Magic series, there's still one more character to go. Star Swirl. When are they going to show that? And if they're going to show that, who are they going to get to voice him? That, that's, no, seriously, that's going to be a really tough choice yeah. because he They built him up for so long. Yes. <laughs> they, he has been this mystical character yeah. that they've talked and talked and talked about but never really introduced. Yeah. Okay. We can't focus too much on that because... Well, back on... we got to get back on topic. Health of information. Right. There wasn't that much comedy in this episode except for nonstick pan <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Fluttershy trying to tunnel under the door when obviously there's a doorknob, that kind yeah. of thing. But I do like the intent of the lesson that they were trying to portray here. And I do like that they were taking some pretty good steps to show off why this is a good lesson to learn. I don't know if they took all the good necessary steps to show that why this is a good le lesson to learn. Because our first impression when we were <coughs> watching this episode uh, Tarek thought that there wasn't a really yeah. good aha moment. I was watching, and you know, it, at the very end, when she came back and she was talking to Zakora and she said, this is the lesson that I learned, you need to take care of yourself and that kind of thing. And I said, well, where did she learn that? I didn't see, through the first um, viewing, I didn't see the point where Fluttershy actually had that kind of aha moment. It's like, oh my gosh, I really should have been t taking care of myself all of this time. Granted, she had the three days sleep, and it was only after the three days sleep that she actually came upon the idea. But did she ever really make that connection? I didn't see that. And then afterwards, we went back and watched a couple of scenes again, especially that trying to dig under the door scene. And then it was more, hey, it's if you're taking care of yourself, you're able to think more clearly. And if you're able to think more clearly, you're better able to help those you're trying to be responsible for. So I guess it's implied yeah. that once she was able to get the rest that she needed, then she was able to think clearly enough to figure out, oh, it's the mask that she, that she must have used in order to get the honey from the hive. Something I want to talk about quickly about that mask. I think it would have worked better if it's not just, hey, Fluttershy looks like their queen, but rather, hey the mask itself was covered in, say, scent glands, so it smells like their queen. I think it would have made more sense. It makes so much more sense. I mean, you're trying to teach this lesson, especially involving bees. You know, how, how much do bees actually depend on sight, aside from things like 
touch and smell and sound and things like yeah. that. It, you know, it's, it's just going on visual would able to, to fool the entire hive of bees. I mean, the last time that someone tried to use a visual to fool a hive of bees, Winnie the Pooh just got blasted, so it didn't work. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> I think that the lesson is effective, though. More effective than what we originally had expected yeah. when we watched it the first time through. It wasn't until the second time when we were going over certain seas we realized, yeah, the writers did have a better understanding of what they were trying to portray. It's still got some dark implications, though. Um, only if, if you really go that direction yeah. when you think about it. Uh, I mean, it's, ah. it's very possible that someone could come away from this episode thinking it's just a kind of a fun little romp yeah. with, when, you're, when you're talking about messing with um, a beehive and how it kind of... It, it, could have gone really bad, but it didn't. Yeah. Imagine for a moment that that's where timber wolves come from. Oh, wow. Warped pony magic that draws all the wood together over and over and over again. You insist on going down this dark road, don't you? Yeah, because it's fascinating. <laughs> I find it fascinating to think about these things because it's... It's... Interesting, the implications. <laughs> I can see the headcanon gears yeah, I know. in his head. I, I've been doing this for years. This is, this is the kind of videos I, I like to make. What if, and what if, and oh my goodness, what if? So that's a big what if, yeah. and you know, someone, someone on YouTube, take that idea, run with it, and yeah. make your fan fiction. I want to see fan fiction stories come out of that idea. I mean, you ever wonder why nobody settled near the Everfree Forest for so long? Maybe they did. Maybe it's because the Everfree Forest was settled and then wasn't. Yep. But just ideas. <laughs> it's a fun little episode by itself. It's just a dark episode if yep. you get really start to think about it. <laughs> uh, final, you know, final result. In my mind, I'll, I'll give this a 6.5. Yeah. You know, it's... It was fun, it was cool to watch, it was nice to see some funny moments with Twilight. Uh, it was cool to see Zakora on, this, on the screen again, um, and to get a little bit of, uh, more world building and some lore. Um, probably not something that is really compelling that would make me want to come back and watch it again. Yeah. I give it slightly above average, personally. It has interesting lore, interesting implications. Not that much in the way of comedy outside of particularly couple of moments. But it does lead to possibilities in the future. Like I said, five out of the six Legends of Magic characters. Yeah. I haven't been reading the comics, so I can't know anything more about these characters yet. But I am intrigued to see what they could do with Star Swirl. We'll see. It'll be fun. In the meantime, though, all this next week, I am going to be out on vacation. I will too. Wait yeah. a minute. Yeah. We're going to be in the same place anyway. Yeah, we're going to be in the same place. And we're going to have Lightning Bliss with us. Hooray! Yes. And we're going to have uh, all four of his kids and his wife. And Lightning Bliss is bringing her husband Lars along, and I'm going to bring my lady along. So there will be ten of us in total. I don't know if we're ever going to be able to just sit around the same table when we eat meals. This is going to be interesting. Yeah. Anyways, looking forward to a whole bunch of things. 